Okay, well thank you ladies and gentlemen uh, for joining us this morning. Um, I thought what a, the, the, the panel's topic for today is talking about uh, Australia's infrastructure market opportunities. Uh, the project pipeline and secondary asset sales. And I think it's a very good follow-on from what Jacques was saying about the interest of his fund in Australia. So I'd ask each of the panelists to take a few minutes maybe and give us your views on what you see the state of play being uh, uh, in this country today. Talk on, Kerry, could we start with you? Um, I thought I'd just start by making four points. The first um, is we're all very aware of the need to increase productivity in the country and I think uh, the focus on infrastructure, it's always easy to just think about projects, but if everybody could turn their mind to thinking about particularly systems and the way we can use what we've got much better, and train control systems and traffic control systems and some investment in what's now relatively acceptable things like Opal Cards in Sydney are all going to really um, help a lot in productivity and give us a bigger bang for our buck. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention was what's happening in New South Wales, which we're all aware of. There's, since um, the coalition government got in, there's been um, a really significant amount of asset sales that have been happening quietly. And unlike previous asset sales, those proceeds are not going to decrease the liabilities of the public sector superannuation funds. They're going in to uh, restart New South Wales to contribute to more infrastructure. Um, so Infrastructure New South Wales is running the spending of the money that comes from those proceeds. But what has occurred has been um, a long-term lease of the desalination plant, the sale of the ports that was alluded to earlier. Currently the Newcastle port is for sale. Um, I'm in the process of running the sale of the electricity generators. Um, I know everyone in the room hopes once we get through that we can move on to poles and wires and transmission which will um, not happen until the community of New South Wales thinks it's a good thing at the next election. Um, there are a number of other assets in New South Wales but also in other states uh, that would be useful uh, for fitting that bill. And Infrastructure Australia has done a recent study of what's around that could be sold and used to recycle assets because we've got a fiscal problem as everybody knows. And just quickly, um, uh, the importance of um, Infrastructure Australia in trying to get some national regulation sorted out. Um, it's the first time we've had a body that looks at things from a national perspective. And I don't know how the Canadians deal with your federal provincial relations, but <coughs> our federal state relations are fraught and particularly in the area of regulation. And in areas like water, there's no way you should be dreaming about the privatisation of the water utilities until the regulation gets sorted out. Um, so I think um, there's things going forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Very good. Tony? Well, thank you, Dennis. Um, well, look, I agree, as usual, with everything Kerry said and Rod said. I think the thing is, at the moment in Australia, it's fair to say the skills and the capital are available to do as much infrastructure as we want to do. Well, it's laid to rest that furphy that we're going to be stretched from a capital or a skills basis. We're coming off an investment boom in resources, and much, much bigger than anything that's in the pipeline, the immediate pipeline for infrastructure. So we've got the skills and resources, and all we need now, and as we've always needed, is the political will. The political will is paramount. And we are getting that now. We're getting it at the Commonwealth level, who are contributing significant amounts of money in cash or in balance sheets of major projects. And the states are starting to pick up the ball and run with it, particularly Queensland, West, uh, New South Wales and Victoria. And we've got some really significant projects running on the East Coast. And there's a lot of worldwide enthusiasm from investors and from constructors from all over the world. So the pipeline now is real. We still have issues on facilitation. I think in terms of things like uh, the cost of projects 
is obviously grown very significantly over the last 10 years for a variety of reasons, but industrial relations is one of them. That must be fixed. We must bring back the ABCC, which controls the construction unions. Environmental approval and planning, still a nightmare in Australia. Probably not bad by an OECD standard, but certainly difficult enough with overlapping jurisdictions between the Commonwealth and the federal and the state governments. A bit of a, a nightmare. I'm certainly very much in favour of legislative support for major projects, particularly like they have here in Victoria, which has worked very well and given a lot more surety to the process. Perennially short of, uh, perennially short of long-term debt in Australia for infrastructure projects, that's been a problem, and uh, certainly our market for long-term debt has not developed sufficiently post the GFC, and I think that's an issue. Uh, I think uh, we're getting encouraging signs that governments now on PPPs are encouraging innovation and unsolicited proposals and that sort of thing, and I think that's very important. To not be prescriptive in putting PPP projects to market, but to allow the private sector to be innovative. Uh, government isn't necessarily the repository of all truth. Um, and I think uh, certainly post the GFC, so realism about how much market risk the private sector is prepared to take and to give support for early market risk, I think, is an intelligent thing to do. And I suppose in that respect, things like recycling assets is one way of getting around that. So in the case of the West Connex project, the $10 billion project that I'm sharing in Sydney, the concept is we do stage one, sell it, put the proceeds into stage two and so on. I think that's a, a very, very good approach and I think it'll work. So I think uh, things are looking good for infrastructure. Let's just get on with it. Excellent. Thank you very much. David, I, I gave you a short, shortened introduction. I didn't finish as we were that's trying fine, to find Dennis. our seats, but you're the Global Head of Utilities and Infrastructure at ANZ. Um, over to you for uh, some private sector comments. Private sector. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Dennis. Look, um, I agree with everything Kerry and uh, Tony have said. Um, probably for me, probably two or three points, and as a uh, banker, my natural uh, disposition is probably to be more um, um, optimistic as to where we will actually go. Um, I think, as Tony said, it's it's highly dependent on the necessary uh, political will. Um, I think it's actually there f for the first time in a um, long time, both at a federal and a um, state uh, level. And I think with that um, with that level of um, optimism, the the three. Uh, things that I see are uh, positive uh, coming out of this is everybody's talking about transmission and uh, distribution as being the major assets which could get sold in uh, New South Wales or uh, Queensland. Um, I think that's given the size of them are huge, the capacity for private sector debt and equity to play in that is absolutely huge as well. Um, but I think if we get the if the if the right policy setting is there to actually allow those transactions to happen, I think we'll see a whole lot of other transactions come to the market which we probably haven't seen in the past. I take uh, Kerry's point that I think uh, water's got to be one of the last things off the um, uh, off the shelf, but there's an awful lot between transmission, distribution, and um, uh, water. So I think that's the first point. Um, second point around. PPPs. We've seen a lot of innovation in the last two to three years in uh, particular in terms of how the state governments have chosen to uh, view how they procure those assets but also um, the level of risks that some of the private sector will be uh, willing to take. We've seen it in uh, prisons in particular that there's more um, operating risk uh, being assumed and that, that could potentially be uh, broadened across the um, uh, other PPPs that are uh, potentially to hit the market. And last but not least, um, Tony mentioned the lack of the lack of a long-term debt in uh, the Australian uh, bond market. Um, I think if these asset sales happen, the the bank market uh, will be able to uh, will, will be able to cope. But the numbers involved are quite large. Um, Today, there's about 30 to 35 billion of total debt in the transmission and distribution market in um, Australia. Um, if, the, if New South Wales and Queensland sell, and I, I admit it's a big if, um, the total debt requirement is anywhere between 45 to 50 billion dollars. 
Um, so the Australian bank market will, will be challenged to provide that, and I think to have an appropriate capital structure going forward that the bond market's going to have to uh, grow and develop, and we've seen that positively develop in 2013, and I'm optimistic that, that it will continue to grow. Uh, and I think that will be one of the catalysts which will actually pull it, um, pull it along. Is it Dennis? Okay, thank you. Um, and just remember, we'll take questions from the floor as we go through this. Um, perhaps the one thing that, that's come out of uh, these comments has been the importance of, uh, of having a pipeline and having political will uh, to get on with things. Uh, there is a sense of optimism, I think, following a, a, some of the audit territory that you've been involved with, and Tony, certainly what you're involved with, and I can't say anything yet. Um, but could you comment a little bit about what we've seen sort of in the last two or three years, a little bit further on some of these changes we see happening? Uh, is the public coming along with it, et cetera? Uh, um, it's a bit astonishing you think that an audit is optimistic because certainly in my experience you finish the Commission of Audit and you just feel so depressed about the state. <laughs> I don't know how Tony's going, but the, the financial state that the government's in. Um, but what it did do was basically set a stage where it was a problem that had to be tackled. And at the state level, now they're trying to run surpluses to fund infrastructure as well as having um, asset recycling going on. So you are seeing particularly public transport projects like Northwest Rail and um, the light rail projects in Sydney coming up. And there'll be more of that as, as the f fiscal position gets addressed. And I'll leave Tony to comment on his, the optimism of the federal budget doesn't feel too good to me. <laughs> yeah, so all, um, I, Kerry, I share your concern. I mean, at the federal level, of course, the position is far worse because the budget's far bigger. and. Um, it is extremely depressing when you look at the, uh, the the outlook, and I don't have to go in what we've found, but my EFO, you know, the mid-year economic review showed that. So if you look at ten years, it looks pretty bad. Um, but as you've shown in New South Wales and in Queensland, if you bite the bullet and get in there and make the reforms and reform your fiscal strategy and start investing in infrastructure and recycling assets, your economy recovers. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, Fiscal rectitude on the behalf of the state can, in fact, inspire investment confidence and get the economy moving. And so that's the challenge now for the federal government. Uh, our friends across the ditch in New Zealand have tackled that over the last five years, and they're now growing at 3.5% GDP, and we're growing at 2.5% GDP. So I think the proof of the pudding is there in terms of if you accept this, do the work, fix yourself, then the economy will get going again. David, yeah. anything else? Oh, I'll try and stay out of politics if I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the comments this morning, uh, particularly around IA and some of the changes, I think for some of the visitors to the country, there's been a lot in the press of late. Um, I'm just wondering, Kerry, in particular, given you're on board and some other things, if you could just uh, give us a little bit of an update as to where things are at. Um. Well, at the moment, the uh, new Infrastructure Australia Bill is wending its way through Parliament very slowly and the uh, upper house is um, um, sort of not moving anything, uh, certainly not the IA Bill, so Mark's probably more up to date than I am, but um, from where I sit, not a lot's happening. Um, one thing that's quite positive that is happening is the um, the favourable tax position for priority infrastructure projects. Um, the IA is sort of busily, I know, assessing various projects for that list which would lead to slightly more favourable treatment of tax losses going forward. And I think things like that are just a mm -hmm. And you so see... I, it's still a watch this space. Right. Some of the changes are long term after it gets through in terms of trying to get longer views, uh, pipeline, these sorts of things, greater certainty. Do you yes. feel that these are all? They're all, very, they're all very commendable and I also think um, putting something in place where the board selecting the um, CEO and giving much more um, power, if you like, to the organisation 
and less uh, absorption into the government and department is probably going to be better. Yeah. So I guess echoing on Rod's comments this morning about some of the political changes and the ability to derail this long-term pipeline that we look for and certainly the stability that people are looking for when they invest these, uh, these funds in our country. Yeah, I think, look, I think the two things that IA has done that it should feel proud about, as Rod mentioned, is the standard of, the standard of uh, submissions that are coming in now are just chalk and cheese compared to what they used to be. Um, it used to be the case that only Victoria could do a reasonable submission, and um, largely because they've been at it longer than the other jurisdictions and have always <coughs> taken it seriously, but the other jurisdictions have come up. And I think the other really important thing that IA has tried to do, though not always successfully, is try to fix up um, national problems, national regulation around transport and safety and the like. And it's like Groundhog Day for all of us. It's been going on for decades and still not fixed. But, you know, at least there's a body there that's trying. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of that, Tony, uh, BCA, uh, uh, the Productivity Commission has been out getting lots of uh, advice from a lot of people and I think Peter Harris is due to release something soon. Could you comment a bit on the BCA's submissions into pipeline sure. and all these things, how it sure. impacts on productivity? Well, we see uh, I infrastructure, and particularly economic infrastructure, is one of the, the keys to improving productivity in the country and uh, that's mainly in the transport field. And they're all very obvious, uh, I think, the links that are missing and the investments has got to be made in roads and rail and ports and what have you. Um, we, we've stressed that we agree that we have limited capital available at the national and state level, so projects should be independently assessed, cost-benefit analysis done on a professional and thorough basis, and uh, we should prioritise our investment in capital and uh, avoid pork barrelling wherever possible, because we don't really have the the resources to waste. And David, there's a lot written and talked about these days on funding and financing and the difference between the two and you're talking, a number of the speakers are talking about long-term capital availability. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see this, uh, elaborate a bit more on some of these projects, this pipeline you refer to? and where, what sort of changes we're looking to see in this country for long-term debt? Yeah, look, I think um, uh, 2013 was probably um, one of the better years in the local domestic bond market, particularly for our credit, um, where, <clears throat> and this for the Canadians in the audience, um, going out to seven years was a major achievement for the vast majority of bonds in Australia. So um, uh, that's always been a, a challenge. The, the, the bond market, unless it's um, A minus or above, has always struggled in the lower in investment grade space. I, I think, I think to, my, to my comment earlier, I think the vast majority, the, the, the vast um, volume that will actually be needed, I think, will be the, um, will be the key factor that, that will force it. We are seeing corporates go out to uh, 10 years within, within the Australian market again. Um, I just think it's an um, evolution. The product hasn't hasn't been there post uh, GFC and pre GFC. It was all uh, wrapped, so it was a completely different type of our product. Um, with more product coming to the market, I think there's more there for the uh, for the funds to get their heads around, to commit the resources, uh, to to uh, spend the time uh, on that lower in investment grade space, and I think that ultimately um, will be the um, will be the uh, driver. I, I think your point around pipeline is uh, well made. Um, I think we're at a point in time where um, uh, Tony said we have a lot of the um, capital, both human resource and um, and uh, financial, to be able to uh, do these deals. I think we're at a point now where everybody is reasonably well geared up to do it. I think we need to keep the pipeline going, uh, and I think if we do that, you'll see um, a significant amount of more human resource uh, capital um, consumed by other sector because we're certainly at a point within the banking space that yeah. Um, we are we are beginning to be stretched, which is which is good, um, but we need that pipeline to continue to ensure that we've got the confidence to be able to hire our going forward. I Maybe might not. just make a comment on the length of debt. I'm on the board of T Corp that raises the debt for the New South Wales government, and recently we raised some um, twenty year uh, length debt for the first time since the GFC, 
and you know previously there was a fair whack of 25 years CPI linked raisings going on which just vanished and uh, it now looks as if the following comments from David that longer term debt market at least for semis is starting to uh, get some breath back in it which is uh, which is good for infrastructure um. Okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> One of your boxes ticked on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, After. <laughs> yes. One, one of the big challenges, I guess, to sustain this level, this pipeline, this level of activity comes back to the politics and the political will. And I guess the real challenge is getting the electorate across the, the line. And in some respects, if you look at Queensland, I mean, uh, a previous premier was selling assets and uh, for other reasons, I'm sure, but got into a bit of trouble. Um, do you see that there is a sense out there through the various organizations that, that you're, you represent uh, um, that we are educating the, the community, the community is coming along the journey that will allow governments to do this sort of stuff? I think they're getting there. I, mean, I think the, the reaction to, of the community to the private sector owning and operating infrastructure in Australia has shifted. Not as far as we'd like, but I think it's shifted. I think there's still a lot of angst in the community about privatisation. But again, I think if that's characterised by recycling of assets, I think that's quite saleable. Uh, and uh, I think early market soundings would indicate that the community will accept that, provided it is clearly hypothecated into new projects. That's the dirty word though, isn't it, with treasuries? <laughs> no, I think treasuries are now accepting the reality. Is that which is, is hard for economists. But, yeah. <laughs> Because that is the, the big mm. condition, isn't it, it is. for public acceptance of these things? It is. Hypothecation. Mm. I don't think we've previously done a very good job at selling, selling privatisation. And I think, um, along with the, ge the general acceptance of private sector operation, I think the other thing that's recently happened is a more direct spending of some of the proceeds in the local communities that are most affected. So that with the Port Botany and Port Kembla sales, um, Port Kembla area were tagged some money for their development and with the Port of Newcastle, Newcastle for many years has wanted to get the heavy rail out of the middle of Newcastle and that they will be, uh, they will receive money to do that so long as the Port of Newcastle sale proceeds. So those sorts of things really are game changers because there's some benefit for the community that is most impacted by the change. And David, from your side? Yeah, I think um, one of the challenges as we've seen is around um, power out prices, uh, to be honest, because I think that, that, that's going to have a huge impact upon the uh, message and the narrative that's built around potential um, privatisation of transmission and their distribution, because obviously the um, electricity prices have been going up quite substantially, and I don't think there's been a proper dialogue and debate about what, what the real key drivers of that are and um, whether it depends on which side of our politics you're on, it was carbon or it wasn't carbon, uh, it was uh, green energy or it wasn't green energy. Um, and it's a far more complicated debate than that and I think that's actually the challenge that, uh, that uh, the politicians have and I think it's one that um, industry has to get involved with as well uh, because unless we get that right and get the Get, the, get a real understanding out to the population as to what it actually means and why the prices are the, where they are for the variety of reasons, um, I think the narrative going forward is going to be harder and harder. Are there any questions from the floor? Maybe most people are thinking about questions from the floor. Uh, we, we could talk a little bit more, Tony, uh, in particular, you've been involved in many great uh, PPP projects over the years, and you've seen the evolution from uh, you know, CityLink, Connect East, uh, West Connects now, and I think you touched on it, on some of the uh, way that the model has changed and transition, and I think previous speakers have talked about risk and these type of issues, um, risk transfer setting it up right. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of that with the, the group today. Yeah, I think the, the market has matured. I, I think two things have happened in the last few, you know, five or six years. I mean, one is the capital's appetite for huge risk has passed, so we're back to a far more rational approach, and and I think that's that's good because you don't want investments failing. The second thing too is I think that governments in doing PPPs now are increasingly looking at 
the quality of the infrastructure it provided, but also the quality of the service provided. That just because you've outsourced or privatised doesn't mean you have a reduction in the standard of the service. In fact, if you contract intelligently, you can probably get an improvement, significant improvement in many cases, in the quality of the service provided. And I think that's a very important facet in selling privatisation and PPPs. I think that's been a great development. And again, I think Victoria, certainly in the toll road space, has pioneered that in many respects. But I think the other states are picking that up, and I think that's a good thing to do. I think um, one of the areas I, I think that we still got a lot of work to do around the PPP space is um, using the model for our smaller scale out projects. Um, I think Mark showed the stats that said they spent 64 billion at 200 odd out projects. Um, if you look at those stats in Australia, the number of projects is substantially smaller. We tend to use it for the very big projects, um, and that may be due to the nature of the uh, procurement. That, that uh, we do and the time and the cost, etc. Um, but it, <clears throat> I think, again, a, a kicker to the um, infrastructure out market here would be if we can come up with a more streamlined framework to allow that to be used for smaller scale projects rather than the uh, multi billion dollar ones. Yes, I was uh, interested to see the slide that the water and wastewater treatment plant, which was a very small plant, and I know that there are lots of local councils in New South Wales that would like uh, something like that, but the cost of those small <coughs> projects is really very, just getting them set up is very high, so we've got to try and get through that cost problem, I think. Can you get a sort of a cookie cutter approach going, yeah, you do you should. think, on small projects? Well, you, that's the answer, I think. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have anything to share on that? Any insight? <laughs> We have that great project, but quite frankly, it's hugely challenging at the municipal level in Canada, and it's in part because most of our municipalities are neophytes when it comes to the infrastructure development, so there's a huge learning curve there. And um, I'd be interested, in fact, um, if you have the same issue and yep, how you're trying to address that. The other point is that um, th there is a significant cost issue. So for the majority of, of DPP projects, you know, the upfront cost is high because of all the advisory services and all that. So one of the areas that, that we're just beginning to explore now is something around PPP light. So how can you develop uh, almost you know, some kind of, of, a, of a one stop shop where a municipality can go and sort of plug into a consortium of services at a manageable cost that would allow them to actually move ahead with that. And th but these are all sort of very embryonic uh, uh, thoughts. Well, let us know when you've got it developed and we'll steal it. Why don't you come help us? Yeah, we will. It's part of that partnership we yeah, talked about, yeah. Jacques was talking about earlier. We've touched on costs quite a bit here, and I guess that's a segue into cost of projects in Australia, which again opens up the discussion around labor and shortages, unions, etc. Uh, it's a pretty broad field that I'm throwing out to you. Uh, any comments that you'd like to share? Uh, well, the, we at the BCA, we did a study and we found it very hard to nail down between resources and infrastructure, but very rough rule of thumb, we felt that the blowout in cost for Australia were about a third planning and regulation, a third labour, and a third, I guess, just the pressure in terms of resources, the resources sector of getting stuff done quickly, the inefficiencies in project management, supply chain, particularly transport in Australia, those sorts of inefficiencies that come from the pressure of trying to get something done quickly in a remote environment. So a third labour, a third project manager and contracting supply line and, and uh, a third planning and environmental approvals, which are a nightmare in Australia, yeah, no, no. at the federal and state level. And do you, do you feel optimism, again, this word that we're looking for in terms of changes that are going to fix that up, going to address some of these situations? Well, I think the, the federal government's agreed that they will go to the one-stop shop for assessment of environmental approvals for major projects. That's a fantastic breakthrough. We've been pushing that for some time. New South, uh, New South Wales is leading in terms of planning reform. If those planning reforms get through, that will become, I think, a model for the rest of the Commonwealth. Certainly would simplify and expedite planning approvals without, I think, compromising quality. 
necessary? It's a big if. <laughs> it's a big if, yeah. yeah. If my Audi had wheels, she'd be a car. <laughs> yeah. But you're optimistic, aren't you? <laughs> I'm optimistic about the labour part of it, but I'm not so optimistic about the planning part of it. I think that we're still very clunky and it's getting, it is getting better and attempts are being made, but we're not ready yet. And what about the unsolicited bid uh, um, or structure that's been put in place in New South Wales, Victoria? I think it's good. I think it's yeah, very it's good. I think it's really good. See, when we did the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, the first one, that was unsolicited. <laughs> I'm still going, uh, Nick Ryan still hasn't got over the shock of it. <laughs> he was the leader of the opposition at the time. <laughs> but he's embraced the concept since, which I'm happy to see. <laughs> <laughs> Any rate of reply? No, <laughs> David, what about from your side? Yeah, no, look, I think it'll, it'll help to increase out of the pipeline. I think um, it will take time. It's encouraging that Victoria has been more definitive in the recent past around its um, framework, but uh, yeah, it's all that positive. Yeah. And the, the, the discussions around labour and some inquiries that are being launched. Uh, do we see again this uh, being a positive as we go forward? Uh, oh, hopefully, some we'll, of the hopefully we'll get some changes, but until the federal government gets the Senate voting more in accord with the wishes of the people, yep. uh, we won't have, have much of an improvement, I, I suspect. Uh, that's your reason yeah, for yeah. lack of optimism? And uh, no, I'm... Palmer and gonna help us? Oh, no, I actually do think that, that we will get um, uh, labour market reform and with the with the mining investment wave, you know, passing, there are more skills around and available, so there's less there's less pressure. But my lack of optimism is really around planning reform more than anything else. Okay. Um, anything from anybody? No? Um, if you contrast, I think. Um, Victoria versus New South Wales. One, one of the, the big challenges for governments of, of the day is uh, uh, how much do you have in the house to sell? Okay. And I think if you look at Victoria in the 90s, uh, you know, tremendous success. Uh, uh, I think I joked with Jeff Kennett once, the only time he became popular was after he left. Everybody looked at his legacy and said he's the greatest premier we've had, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of stuff was done in the 90s. Victoria jumped, uh, I think uh, it would be safe to say, as a now, a, now an Australian, I can say it, uh, jumped the leader of the pack for quite a while. And New South Wales was always looked at as being a little bit of a, uh, a laggard until some good management took over and fixed it up. Uh, but you know, there's, I get, the, the challenge comes as to how often can you do this? And I think now the challenge for Victoria is we've got limited assets left to sell here. New South Wales is tremendously rich with stuff. Um, what would you s say to that? Oh, I'd put Kerry shot in charge. <laughs> <laughs> She's done a great job in selling the assets. So, yeah. She's done a great job so far in selling the assets, and then the Commonwealth hasn't got much left. That's the uh, that's the, the problem. So it's not really in, in a in a federal sense the answer to the problem in terms of infrastructure funding. Although it could make a worthwhile contribution, it's not certainly enough left in terms of assets to, right. to fix the problem, as it were. Look, there's still a lot to do in terms of running better systems and traffic control and all of those sorts of things, which I know the Victorians are looking at some systems on their trains to run them closer together, which would increase productivity quite, yeah. quite astonishingly. And you know, it's now about getting what we've got working, working better. And um, we're very happy to have Victorians showing the way if they put their thinking caps on. The other thing I think that's emerging is we all focus on capital. We, we, yeah. we never focus on maintenance. And uh, because you know, politicians love to cut a ribbon, you can't cut a ribbon when you've just repaired a road or put in some new railway track, it's yeah. boring. And really, I mean, sweating the assets we've got and making them work as efficiently as possible gives you a significantly better cost benefit than fresh fresh assets in many cases. So I think we've got to have a resurgence on investment in maintenance and getting the best out of our assets. And as Gary's given in that example, if, 
if you can reduce the separations between trains, it's as, it's as good as putting in an extra track. So we should do a lot more of that. Uh, as an operator of an asset, I totally agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you're not on our board anymore. Yeah. <laughs> David, do you have? Uh, yeah, look, I agree. I think uh, using what we've got the hell of a lot that better uh, makes makes more sense. If you look at rail, whether it's a new, it's new uh, signaling system, whether it's increasing the size of trains, um, it can all, it can all um, exponentially uh, increase the um, productivity of the states. I, I think, I think to challenge you on Victoria, I think there's actually a lot of assets in Victoria, but the regulatory framework's not there for allowing them to be sold yet. So while people think port is the only thing that can actually go, um, if you look at the water system, um, to, to, uh, to uh, Kerry's point earlier, um, that is a substantial asset which could, which could substantially help. Um, and I think you've also got to remember about Victoria, we're, we're about, <clears throat> I, think the, I think the figures are, and I could be wrong on this, but at an at a, at a absolute debt level, we're about the same as we were when Kenneth started selling assets, but as a percentage of, a G, of um, GSP, we're, we are way, way safer than uh, when we were then. So um, I, think, I think we've got to get comfortable with this debt level. It's the perennial Australian issue as to what's the, what's the right level of debt, but uh, it's about how productive you then put that to use. And that's a, maybe a, a good point to, to draw this to a close, but on the debt side, um, you know, there's a lot of commentary around the state's ability to take on debt, the, the Commonwealth's ability to take on debt. I guess, Tony, uh, given your audit, you're going <laughs> to maybe, maybe be thinking well, again. I, yeah, well, I think the Commonwealth's debt level is you know, rising uncomfortably fast and to an uncomfortable level. And I guess it's going to top the 15 or 16% level in GDP in a few years' time. And uh, that's very uncomfortably high from an historical perceptive perception in Australia. And I think on the state's side, I mean, the vertical fiscal imbalance between the Commonwealth and the states is untenable. And it is really, I think, very adversely impacting the Federation and its operation at the moment. And that balance has got to be fixed. I think that is a absolute imperative. Yeah. I think um, I started doing economic policy in the late 60s and early 70s when it was sort of like the halcyon days of policy. You had monetary and fiscal policy and it worked and it was truly wonderful and it was relatively um, an easy thing to manage. And those days, I think, are past and they passed with stagflation, but we're now in a slightly different place where I just don't think governments have got on the fiscal side, the degrees of freedom they need, either at the state level, because there's so much demand for services, and indeed at the Commonwealth level. So you just sort of wonder how, what, what can you cut back if you do need to cut back? And if you expand, is it just going to leave incoming governments with a burden they've got to carry forever? And I think, it's a, I think that's a real problem. It's an expectations problem, and it's a, everybody getting older and needing health care problem and, yep. you know, the things we all know about. What's Canada doing about that, Mark? Is you must have an ageing population, do you? Yes, we do. Mm. We, and there's nothing we can do about it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What's the <laughs> use? <laughs> you can work harder. <laughs> Longer. <laughs> Uh, no, look, I, I think it's, I think um, Tony okay. and uh, Kerry have covered all the policy points off. Okay, well, thank you. I, um, I think now Brendan's got his shot back at Mark. I still haven't got mine back at you yet. I'll have, to, I'll have to wait a bit. But uh, please join with me in thanking the panel for the conversation.